So our connection to water is deep. Our spirit is entwined with it. Who can't stare at a calm lake and, and feel a sense of serenity? Or enjoy the majesty of a waterfall? Or a refreshing dip in a cold pool? Or the terror of a tsunami? Water is diverse, powerful, and essential. You can't have great coffee without great water. If you didn't like the coffee out there, it probably wasn't the water's fault. <laughs> Let me let uh, a few famous explorers tell you another thing about water. The Universal Translator is coming online, sir. Ugly. Ugly. Giant. Bags of mostly water. Bags of mostly water. An accurate description of humans, sir. <laughs> so that's true. We are mostly water. Over 60% of our bodies are made up of water. Water also has carved many of our landscapes. The Great Lakes were formed at the end of the last ice age when the glaciers receded and, and gouged great holes in the land. Water has led to the rise of great civilizations and the fall of great civilizations. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt derived a lot of their power from their knowledge and control of the Nile River and its flooding, which spread silt over the, the land to make it fertile again. The ancient Chinese built what is actually still the largest canal in the world, the Grand Canal, quite a long time ago, connecting the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers, which gave them uh, control over a massive amount of land because they could move grain on that water system to, to feed their army and their people. The Romans were master water engineers. You're probably familiar with the aqueducts, but they also invented all kinds of other great technologies. They uh, had water mining. They invented water mills as well. In fact, the per capita water use by the ancient Romans was approximately what we have today, which is really phenomenal here in the West. Oh, let me make one more point about, uh, about history here. So it's a recurring lesson of history that, that civilizations that rely too long passively on old water technology are routinely overtaken by civilizations that innovate to take advantage of water's challenges and opportunities. This is a lesson that we should not forget. More on history, historians will tell you that, uh, that Europe does not have a major inland water system, like it doesn't have the Indies or Ganges or the Yellow or Yangtze or so on. And that is one of the reasons that Europe developed into small independent nations. And that is actually then what led to the rise of liberal democracy. So in a sense, you can thank water for the rise of liberal democracy. So water technology drives revolutions. You can trace this back to things like transoceanic sailing, which globalized civilization. Water wheels, which launched the Industrial Revolution. Watt's steam engine, which revolutionized transportation and, and industry. Water sanitation, revolutionized human lifespans, which extended by 40% or so. Large dams, there are about 45,000 of these things around the world. They finally gave mankind control over water in a way that we never had before because now we could control floods. You could have steady irrigation, which multiplies food production. Also gives you hydropower. This is one of the things that led to the rise of the United States as a global power. Intermodal shipping containers. 90% of global commerce happens on the seas. Water controls our weather. It also moderates our global temperature. This is what allows this to be a livable planet, is the fact that the heat capacity of water keeps the temperature from getting too high or too low. In fact, we have this locally here, too, on a more uh, regional scale. Lake Michigan moderates our local temperatures. If you live near the lake like I do, summers are cooler and winters are warmer than they are elsewhere because, again, of the heat capacity of the water. So let me ask you a question here. We'll see if, uh, if you can get the answer to this one. Who do you think the largest single user, or to be more precise for uh, nitpickers, withdrawer of water is in the United States? Just yell it out. Power plants. So power plants, the way thermo uh, electric power plants work is they uh, are typically sited next to a, a, a lake or a river, and they bring in water and they boil that water to make steam by burning coal or natural gas or using uh, react heat from nuclear reactions. 
that makes steam, turns turbines, and makes electricity. And this accounts for over 200 billion gallons of water every day, which is approximately half of what we use in this country. So that's one big connection between energy and water, but the flip is also true. The vast uh, uh, use of our electricity, the largest use of our electricity, goes to the treatment, distribution, and use of water. So these two facts form the core of what's called the energy water nexus. That's why here's a picture to report from the Department of Energy. You can understand why the Department of Energy would be interested in water because of these deep connections between these two topics of energy and water. And there are many other ways in which they're connected, which I, I won't have time to tell you about today. So clearly water is important, but water is invisible. It's actually hidden all around us, even in this room. Let me give you some examples of what I mean. If you take 683 gallons of water, and yes, that's actually 683. <laughs> My son counted them with me. If you take 683 gallons of water, you can grow six pounds of alfalfa hay. And if you take those six pounds of alfalfa hay and you give them to a machine that looks like this, that will give you one gallon of milk. So one gallon of milk doesn't look very big, but it actually represents almost 700 gallons of water. And the same is true for all kinds of food. A single grape, one grape, is a third of a gallon. One walnut, five gallons. One potato, close to seven. A cup of coffee, 37. And that's not counting if it's a latte or cappuccino, it goes way up. Because dairy is a big consumer of water. One Greek yogurt is 90 gallons. And then the, the real demon here in terms of water use would be meat, in particular things like beef. A hamburger doesn't look like much, but it's over 600 gallons of water embedded in there. It's not just food, though. It's in the materials around us. To make steel, you need to use water. One pound of steel, which is not very much steel, of course, that's 11 gallons. All the raw materials around us take water. Plastic, cement, cotton, paper, you name it. You need water to make any of them. And that means the clothes that you're all wearing, the phone that's in your pocket, the car that you drove to get here, all of those things have massive amounts of water embedded within them. And there's a name for this. It's called virtual water. And this is important because we don't move water on a global scale for reasons that I'll explain later. It's not really feasible. But we do move virtual water on a global scale. And there are people who track this. So there are countries that are net exporters of virtual water and countries that are net importers of virtual water. You can see that we, here in the United States, are a net exporter. And you can look at Europe and North Africa and the Middle East and see that they are net importers. I can give you one example of this. There's a, a company called uh, El Marai, which in Arabic means the pasture, um, which is uh, kind of an ironic name because, as I'll tell you in a moment, where that pasture is located. So El Marai, is the largest vertically integrated dairy company in the world, even though probably most of us had not heard of it. It's a Saudi Arabian company, and what they do is they grow alfalfa hay in the American Southwest, and they're using groundwater resources to do that. We'll talk about groundwater in a few minutes. So they grow that alfalfa hay, and then they export it to Saudi Arabia to feed cattle to make dairy. And so we're actually exporting massive amounts of water from the American Southwest to Saudi Arabia without even realizing it. And there are countless other examples of this. So water is clearly important, but it's actually becoming even more important with time. So we don't have a shortage of water on Earth. We got lots of water. The problem is that almost all of it is in the oceans. And salt water is really hard to use for, for most purposes. It's about 97% of the water on Earth is in the oceans, which comes out to be that many gallons, which I think is 352 quintillion, although I can't remember the names for the big ones. So it's only the, the rest of the water, 3% or less, that is actually fresh water. But the situation's even worse than that. So the water that we, that we see around us in lakes and rivers and so on comes because you know, it rains or snows, and then that runs off and, and it's on the surface. That's what we would call renewable runoff. That's the water that's easy to get at, the fresh water that's easy to get at. The city of Chicago pulls its water from Lake Michigan. Another way you can get water is some of that water that runs off percolates through the ground and fills up aquifers and becomes groundwater. And you can build a well and extract that groundwater and use it. And we get a lot of our water that way. You'll notice I put renewable in quotes there. And that's because it's only truly renewable if you're extracting it at a rate that is slower than its 
being recharged. Otherwise, you're going to eventually deplete that resource. And in most cases where there are these aquifers, we're withdrawing it much faster than it's being replaced, and so it's not truly renewable in that sense. There's also other groundwater that's been there for a really long time, in some cases hundreds of thousands of years. And some people call that fossil water akin to fossil fuels. <laughs> akin to fossil fuels, I don't know what that was. Um, because it's been there for so long, not because it's actual fossil organisms like fossil fuels are. Uh, but we use this fossil water, and that's completely unsustainable because it's not going to be replenished for tens or hundreds of thousands of years. An example of this would be Libya. So Libya built something called the Great Man-Made River, and they spent $32 billion to build this thing. And what they're doing is they're bringing fossil water under the Sahara for their, for their use because they need more water. That is only going to last for about 20 years before they've depleted that source, $32 billion. So how is this fresh water distributed? It's shocking to see that that stuff that's on the surface that we see in the lakes and rivers and all that, that only accounts for about 0.3% of that less than 3% of fresh water. About 30% of it is in that groundwater. And then you might ask, where is the rest? That's all locked up in things like glaciers and ice caps and permafrost where we can't really get at it. So we're talking about a really small amount of water that we're all fighting for, for our daily needs. But the situation is worse than that. So I mentioned uh, glaciers. So in the Tibetan Plateau, the Himalayan glaciers, the meltwater from those is the source of a huge number of major river systems, including the ones I've shown here on the screen. This is the source of water for about one and a half billion people on Earth. And because of climate change, these glaciers are melting more fast than they are being rebuilt by annual precipitation. And so those freshwater resources are going to disappear. I don't really have an answer for you for where those one and a half billion people are going to get their water from once that source disappears. So supplies of water are under a huge strain. What about demand? So it's been projected that over the next 35 years, by the year 2050, the world's demand for water is going to rise by 55%. So here we've got a recipe for trouble. We've got dwindling supplies, spiking demand. What does that mean? It means we're going to have conflicts. So just like in the 20th century, oil conflicts kind of shaped global geopolitical order, it's going to be fresh water conflicts that are going to shape this century. And this is already happening to some degree. You can look around the world to places like Central Asia, where the Aral Sea has all but disappeared. And now the Central Asian countries are all uh, sort of battling with each other at this point, mostly politically. But uh, the fear is, of course, that that could escalate over time over the, the remaining resources that there are. In India, places like the Kaveri River have been fought over for a long time in the, the arid south of the country. South America, there are conflicts between Bolivia, which is rather dry, and Chile, which in the north is also very dry, over water uh, resources from the Salala River. The Nile has been a source of conflict since the dawn of human civilization. And in large part, this is because many of the users of the water of the Nile, like Egypt, uh, are not located where the headwaters, where the water begins, which is in places like Ethiopia and Kenya. And so those parts of the, those regions of the world have actually had um, strain for a very long time. The pharaohs tried to fight wars against the, the folks who lived in what is now um, Ethiopia back then for this reason. And we hear a lot about the conflict in the Middle East, particularly the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And we don't hear about it as much here, but one of the big factors in that conflict is, in fact, water, because of the limited resources there. So water is surely the most important material in the world. Yet, as I told you, water is invisible. And this is not good for us or for water. So we've been living in what I would call the golden age of water. And what makes the golden age of water? It's when water is cheap, abundant, and safe. All three. That makes the golden age of water. And when you live in the golden age of water, which is where we've been now for a while, at least in, in parts of the world like the United States, you end up with situations like this. So if you stayed in a, in a Four Points hotel a few years back, I don't think they have this anymore, and you looked at that little bottle of water that comes in your hotel room, it had a sign on it that said this. It's water. Of course it's free. So they were poking fun at the hotels that charge you $4 for the, the bottle of water in your room. But what they're really doing is they're tapping into something primal about our relationship with water. We feel like it should be free because it's been abundant, cheap, and safe. So this isn't new. 
Here's a quote from Socrates. For only what is rare is valuable, and water, which, as Pindar says, is the best of all things, is also the cheapest. And when you underprice water, which is what we're doing, it leads to waste and to poor decisions about how you use your water. So in your home, you have one water inlet that comes into your house, and you use that water for everything. Everything from taking a drink, to brushing your teeth, to doing your laundry, to taking a shower, to wherever you use the water, watering your lawn. What this means is that Americans are flushing over five billion gallons of fresh drinking water down the toilet every day. This is not a very smart use of the water that we've spent so much energy uh, cleaning and, and, and getting to your house. In fact, the water infrastructure is a problem even before it gets to your house. Our water infrastructure under the ground is so old and decrepit, decrepit that one in every six gallons that we go into the, all the effort of cleaning and pumping to you just leaks out from, from cracks in the pipes into the ground, just gone. In fact, we spend about as much on bottled water as you do on maintaining the entire water system in the United States. This is why our infrastructure is aging so much. We don't want to pay to fix it. It's expensive. This hit home for me just recently. I turned uh, 40, not that long ago, and uh, my parents were nice enough to come into town and to make a reservation at a restaurant that I'd been wanting to go to for years. Uh, so drove there, got lucky, found a great parking spot, walked up to the door, and this was the sign on the door. So we didn't get to eat at Green Zebra that night. Ended up driving all the way across town eating at another restaurant. And I want to thank my girlfriend. She actually then drove all the way back with me because I thought, I got to take a picture of that sign for this talk. <laughs> um, so thank you. We also don't take, have a lot of respect for the water that's out there. We put all kinds of stuff in the water that shouldn't be there. Worldwide, about 80% of our sewage is just discharged untreated out into water sources. We have hydraulic fracturing, which threatens our, our water sources in various different ways. We have runoff from farms that dump excess fertilizer nutrients into the water, lead to things like algal blooms, which deplete the oxygen and produce dead zones, like in the Gulf of Mexico. This one I don't need to tell you about. It's been in the news recently. We put heavy metals in the water in all kinds of different ways. The folks in Flint, Michigan can tell you plenty about lead. But there are all kinds of other ones, too. That photo is from when there was a mining disaster where they had the accidental release out in the, out in the west uh, about six months ago or so. Also, because of things like that untreated sewage, there's all kinds of pathogens that we put in the water. And this is one maybe you haven't heard as much about. All those pharmaceuticals that we all take, and, and not just pharmaceuticals, but caffeine and everything else, they all end up in our water. And you can actually measure them. They're all in there in measurable quantities. So every time you take a drink of water, you're actually drinking Prozac, birth control pills, and everything else. But the quantities are so low that they don't have a physiological impact on you. That doesn't mean they're not something to worry about at some level, though. It has been shown that some of these hormones, for example, can affect fish in aquatic systems. So this is something that we need to keep an eye on. So the golden age of water is ending. This is going to reshape how all of us live. It's going to affect how our food is raised, how our communities are organized, and in fact, how our entire economy functions. So remember the golden age, cheap, safe, and abundant. We're not going to be able to have all three of those at the same time anymore. You can usually get two of them. You can usually have abundant water that's cheap, but you probably wouldn't want to drink it. There are places in the world where this is true now. You might be able to have it be abundant and safe if you spend a fortune cleaning it up in a big reverse osmosis plant, like the one pictured there. Or you could have it be cheap and safe, but there'd just not be enough of it, like the drought in California that we've all heard about in recent years. So that sounds like a crisis, and that is coming here, but there's already a crisis in parts of the world. 4,000 children die every day due to lack of access to clean water. I want to pause and say that again. 4,000 children die every day. In the amount of time that we'll be sitting here, that's like 250 children will be dead for this reason. There's no excuse for this in the modern era. Millions of girls in India, and it is mostly girls, have lives just trapped by walking to fetch water every day. 
they don't even have t time to go to school, so they never get to enter the workforce in the same way that their male relatives and colleagues do. The average distance that people have to walk in Africa and Asia to get the water every day is about 3.7 miles, and water is heavy. So you may have heard the, uh, the quote that all politics is local. What I want to convince you of is that it's also true that all water is local. So if you look around the world, there are regions that are water stressed and regions that are not. There are water rich and water poor regions. But the difference is unlike oil or coffee or other goods that can be moved around the planet, you just can't do that with water. So even if there's a place that's having a drought and wants to buy water from somewhere that's water rich, you just can't do it. You can't get the water from point A to point B unless they're nearby. So even if we conserved water here near the Great Lakes where we're relatively water rich, that does nothing to bring water to a village in Haiti, for example, where they might need it. So that doesn't relieve us of the responsibility for good water practices. It just means we're all responsible for our own water, our own water issues. No one else can be responsible for them. So let me address why we can't move water over huge distances. Why don't we have water pipelines? You're all familiar probably with oil pipelines, like what's pictured there, which can move oil over massive distances, right? So one reason is the volumes we're talking about. The volumes of water you'd have to move are orders of magnitude larger than the amounts of oil that you'd have to move, but it also just comes down to simple economics. So you can calculate, or an economist can calculate, what is the value added per acre foot of water? An acre foot sounds like a funny unit. That's the amount of water it would take to cover one acre of land one foot deep. A lot of water, 300 some thousand gallons. So you can calculate what is the value added of that much water if you use it for things like agriculture or say municipal use, and you're talking about a few tens or at most a couple thousand dollars. You can do the same math for an acre foot of oil and it's worth an awful lot more. Now I made this slide before the recent drop in oil prices, so that's probably <laughs> $200,000, but you get the picture. This is why we don't have water pipelines. So I love this quote from, uh, from Ben Franklin. When the well is dry, we learn the worth of water. So we think of it as free, but we shouldn't. It is the most valuable material that we have. So let me turn to some science. What is water? So water looks like this, a molecule of water. So this is the one chemical that I think literally everyone in this room knows the chemical formula for water. What is the chemical formula for water? H2O. That's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. But there's something very important about a water molecule that maybe some of you don't know, which is the shape of the molecule. It looks like what you see here. So the red is the oxygen and the white are the hydrogens. And it's not a straight molecule, like a straight line. The two hydrogens sit on the same side of the molecule. Now it turns out that oxygen likes negative charge more than the hydrogen does. And so because of this shape, you end up with what's called polarity, where the molecule is more negatively charged on one side and more positively charged on the other side. And this one little feature of water, the fact that it's polar, describes all kinds of fascinating things about water. It's the origin of all sorts of neat things. It's what makes microwave ovens work. The fact that they're polar allows them to vibrate due to the microwaves. Water's polarity drives protein folding, which without protein folding, there wouldn't be life. It also leads to this crazy thing that solid water, ice, is less dense than liquid water. That's really unusual for most, most materials. When you make them a solid, they become more dense. Water is different, it becomes less dense. What that means is in the winter, ice floats on the top of bodies of water like Lake Michigan pictured there. And that allows stuff to live in the water in the winter because the whole thing doesn't freeze. If it froze from the bottom up, there would be no liquid water left for, for things to live. But here you get ice on the surface, and that insulates the rest of the water, and you can have liquid water through the winter. So again, life would not exist without this. The fact that water is polar also makes it a really powerful solvent, meaning you can dissolve all kinds of things in water. And that's evidenced by us. Pictured in the background there is a small piece of the metabolism inside humans. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of different chemicals inside us, in our cell, inside our cells, that just make us what we are, and all of them are dissolved in water. That's pretty amazing. But the fact that it's so good at dissolving things means that it's also very easy to pollute, because you can dissolve all kinds of things in it that you don't want to. And this is one of the big challenges with water. Now, there is good news. You can't use up water. The water that's here has been here since before there was life on Earth. What that means is 
that in every glass of water that you pour, that very same water has at some point been inside an oak tree, it's been blasted out by a volcano, and it's been urinated by a dinosaur. <laughs> Sounds gross, but it's true. But it's not gross because no matter how dirty you make water, you can always make it clean again. It doesn't matter what's in that water, you can get it out and get back to pure water. Which begs the question, what does it mean to say that water is clean? So there are different levels of cleanliness for different purposes. If you push it all the way to the extreme and make the water truly just water with nothing else in it, you can't drink it. I mean, you can drink it, but it wouldn't be good for you. It would actually leach important uh, salts and other nutrients out of your body into it to be effectively poison. But you need water that pure in, for example, the semiconductor industry. Now, if you're going to drink the water, you do want it to be pretty clean, but say you're going to water your lawn with it, it doesn't have to be that clean. So today, again, you have this one water feed coming into your house, but we need to rethink that. And interestingly, if we go back to the ancient Romans, who I told you were great water engineers, they already had this idea. They had different streams of water for different purposes in ancient Rome. They ran different water to power their fountains, which could be dirtier than the water they used for you know, bathing or, or drinking, for example. We need to get back to that. The right water for the right purpose, there's a name for it nowadays called fit for use. And this is something that needs to be thought about more as we move forward. So how do you clean water? So there are lots of ways that we've developed as, as a society to clean water. You can do what's called media filtration, basically a big bed of sand that you slowly percolate the water through. And it's not the sand that does the cleaning, it gets a little film on it, a little biofilm, which has uh, bugs in it that eat up all the different pollutants. You can do what we do in most of our water treatment plants, which is that mouthful up there in the center, coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, filtration. That's how most of our water gets cleaned in, in plants today. Uh, you can do membrane filtration. That's what you do uh, uh, under your sink in your kitchen if you've got some water filters there. That's membrane filtration. You can distill water. That's where you boil it and then recondense the vapor and pur purify it that way. And you can also disinfect water. Uh, most commonly, we do that with chlorine. That's what's done in our, in our municipal water supply. You can also do it with ultraviolet light, which is uh, the device that's pictured there. So, okay, so we can clean water and take things out of it. Remember I mentioned 97% of the Earth's waters in the oceans. What about desalination? Can't we just turn that uh, ocean water into fresh water and then that solves our problems, right? But let me give you a sense of the scale of what we're facing here. So this is a plot of uh, desalination capacity globally up to today, basically. It's obviously a projection going into the, the last year or two here. And you can see we're actually ramping up. Desalination plants are, are popping up all over the world, most of them focused in the places you'd expect, like Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Israel, Kuwait, and so on, places that are obviously very dry. So this is great. It's growing. But let me give you a sense of scale here. I'm going to shrink that graph down. So that's the same graph. I just scaled it down in size. So that's the global desalination capacity today is less than 140 in that, those units, millions of cubic meters per day. That's the rate of global water use, 14,000. So we got a really long way to go if we want to get, solve this problem of desalination. And desalination takes a huge amount of energy. And so I'm not sure that this is the, the best pathway forward. OK, let me bring this to a little bit more of a local scale. So it turns out that Chicago land and water, big water projects, have a long history. So if, if you stepped out of your doorstep in the city of Chicago in the middle of the 19th century, it would have been a really gross place to be. There were, the streets were filled with horse and human waste. And people had had enough. And they said, we got we to do this, fix this, we got to build sewers. And so this gentleman here, Ellis Chesbro, uh, decided to build the country's first comprehensive sewer system right here in Chicago. There was a problem, though, that uh, the nature of the, the soil and where the water table and everything is here in Chicago, they couldn't put the sewers under the buildings where they were. So they did something crazy. They actually lifted the city of Chicago with jacks, building at a time, jacked up the city of Chicago high enough to be able to build the sewer, this sewer system. Pretty impressive. So then what were we doing? We had these sewers so that wasn't all the muck on the street anymore, but we were dumping it into the Chicago River. Where did the Chicago River drain? Lake Michigan. Guess where we got our, get our water from? Lake Michigan. And so people started getting sick from cholera and other diseases due to the uh, pathogens in the water. So what do we do? We don't stop dumping sewage into the river. 
We reversed the Chicago River. Actually went out there and made the thing flow in the other direction and built the Chicago Sanitarian Ship Canal, which actually runs uh, just south of here, and dumped all the sewage in there, which I guess solved the problem, although it's a pretty, pretty insane thing to have attempted. And that wasn't the last major water engineering effort in this region. We're, we still have one ongoing right now. Uh, the official name is TARP, the Tunnel and Reservoir Plan, but you may have heard of it as the Chicago Deep Tunnel. So we're doing this because when you have a, the, the sewer system here in Chicago is uh, the same sewer system for storm water and the water that we you know, flush down our drains. And those get mixed. So when there's a huge storm, it overwhelms the system. There's nowhere to, to put all that water and it used to back up into everyone's basement with like raw untreated sewage and that was disgusting, of course. And so what they've done is they've dug these massive tunnels. You can see the people in that picture to get a sense for the scale that guide that huge amount of overflow into massive reservoirs, like the one pictured at the bottom there. And again, you can get a sense for the scale. Those are trucks down in the bottom of that picture. So these are actually the largest such reservoirs in the world, which then collect all of this uh, excess water. So let me bring it home even more. That was Chicago land. Let's talk about Argonne. So at Argonne, there's all kinds of uh, research going on in water, and this is just a, a, a small sampling of the kind of things that are happening here. So uh, we do work here that informs policy, as you could see when I was talking about things like virtual water, how important wallet, water policy is going to be going forward. And so we, uh, we assemble the, the analysis and information to inform our policymakers. We evaluate things like the environmental impact of, of water technologies and, and of impacts on water in general. We do work in agroscience, and that's in terms of agriculture. So I mentioned power plants are the biggest withdrawer of water. Agriculture is the largest user of water. And so making agriculture more water efficient is a, uh, is a really important task and something that people are working on here. But we're also using plants to remediate pollution in water. We also are looking at dating groundwater. I told you that some of that water has been down there for hundreds of thousands of years. How do you even know that? How do you measure how long it's been there to know how quickly it'll be uh, replenished? You have to use some advanced dating techniques like, like what are being developed here at Argonne. I mentioned all the different ways in which water is being polluted and we're working on technologies to mitigate that. And then membranes are gonna be one of the, the central technological pillars of our, of our water future. And we're working here on a number of new membrane technologies. And I'm just gonna very, very briefly tell you about a couple uh, advanced membrane projects in my group, just to bring it home even a little bit more. So one of the big scourges in the, in the water industry is called membrane fouling. Anytime you use membranes to treat water, they eventually get really gross and look like this. They get fouled, biofilms grow on them, that plugs up the pores of the membrane and then you can't use them anymore and they either have to be replaced or cleaned. It's a huge cost and just a real pain for the industry. And to date, there is no real technological solution for this other than just simply replacing the membranes. So we wanted to ask ourselves the question, could you make a membrane that would clean itself? So you can't prevent the, the biofilm from forming, but can you actually get it to clean itself once, the, once the, the, uh, the film starts to form? And can you do it with something like simple sunlight? So what we're, we've done is we've developed a coating that is based on a material called titanium dioxide. Now titanium dioxide wouldn't normally absorb very much sunlight because it has what's called a wide band gap. It doesn't absorb the right type of light, but we can modify it with some chemical doping to make it absorb visible light. And you can see that there, the membrane on the left that's white, that's just normal titanium dioxide. When we dope it, you can see it turns that yellowy orange color, so you, can, you don't have to be a, a scientist with a spectrometer to tell you that that's now absorbing some visible light. And you can see here, uh, we use a, a model molecule, and you can see we shine sunlight on this, simulated sunlight, and we can degrade this, this molecule over time. And so it indeed works that just simply shining sunlight on a membrane like this will break down biofilms, and also potentially organic pollutants, which is uh, a broad spectrum of different materials. The second project I want to tell you about is microorganism removal. I've already talked a lot about the pathogens that we find in water. Turns out they're really hard to get out of water using filtration, which is why that's not how we do it today. The way we deal with uh, pathogens in water today is we do disinfection. Chlorine, that's why we chlorinate our water, is for this reason. Um, and again, you can do it with ultraviolet light. But the reason that it's really hard to filter them out is the size of those pathogens. Viruses and bacteria, some bacteria, are kind of in this size range here. Kind of a few nanometers up to a few hundred nanometers is, is the size window we're talking about. And none of the filter technologies that are out there today can pull out things effectively in that size range. 
You can use filters that are designed for taking out salt and they'll do the job, but that takes a massive amount of energy, so that's not a good solution. So we wanted to say, well, can we make a membrane that could actually filter all pathogens and do this with filtration instead of with the harsh chemical treatments, which have their own um, unfortunate byproducts. So without going into the details here, the way we approach this is we take a class of materials called block copolymers. And these are amazing materials that can assemble themselves into highly ordered structures. So you don't have to do it. They do it all by themselves. And you can build ordered structures like what you see there, a film with, with cylinders in it with two different materials. And when you, we can use technologies that we've actually developed and, and patented here at Argonne that transform, in this case, the blue material, one of the polymers, into something like titanium dioxide. You can then remove the residual polymer and be left with a nanoporous film, which you can stick on any kind of a support and have yourself a isoporous membrane. Well, all the pores are the same size, and we can tune that size to target exactly the pathogen we want to go after. And we're not all the way there yet in terms of filtering out pathogens, but I can show you here, here's a micrograph of, of one such film, and you can see that we're getting pretty close. So th there's a scale bar for you, 200 nanometers. You can see those pores are maybe 25 nanometers in size, which is right on the length scale of most viruses. And so we're getting close to where we're trying to get already. Okay. So we have a lot of big global challenges that we hear about all the time. But it's hard to muster affection for things like climate change or certainly our financial system, right? That it's hard, can't really have a lot of affection for the financial system. But our affection for water is innate and powerful. We are born with this. We all love water. And this is good for us and for water. So I encourage you all to, to start seeing water. It's invisible, but it's around us, and we need to pay more attention to it. And I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Thanks for your attention. Nicely done. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Thank you very much uh, for helping us better understand the story of water and uh, what the next chapter might be. We appreciate it. Thank you. We do have time for a few questions. And, uh, we've got some ushers in the room that are going to uh, be manning the microphones. And, and I'd ask you to hold your question until you're handed a microphone, actually. I see we've got one right here, Doug. Towards the end, when you were talking about the very small membranes, what, what impact does that have in terms of the amount of energy required to filter those Great pathogens? Point. Yeah. yeah, so um, the smaller the pores, uh, the, more, the harder you have to push to get water to go through it. Um, and that's why you wouldn't use, so a reverse osmosis membrane, that's what you use under your sink and it's what you use to desalinate water, uh, would take out all the pathogens because the pores are, are, are even smaller than atoms, and, you know, it's smaller than molecules, so you would stop all the pathogen with, with that. But because they're essentially non-porous, you really got to shove on those things to get the water to go through. Huge amount of energy, and it just doesn't make economic sense to do that to filter out pathogens, which is why we, we tend not to do it that way. Um, you basically have no choice but to make the hole, if you want to do it with filtration, to make the holes smaller than the thing you're trying to filter, right? A colander in your sink's not going to do well with your pasta. If the holes are bigger than the pasta, they'll just go right through. Um, so there, there's a certain price you have to pay, but you don't have to, you want to make them just the right size, if you will. And it's important that they all be the same size so that you don't have to do multiple passes through lots of filters because then you pay that energy price multiple times. So if all the pores are the right size, you only pay it once, that, that helps you a lot. The other thing we can do is make the membranes very thin, because the, lo the longer that pore is that it has to go through, the more, again, pressure you're going to have to apply. So making it thin, all the same size is the key, and that's exactly what we're targeting. So a little bit more about those um, pathogen filters. What would we do considering the um, like positive bacteria and viruses that we have? Because would we be able to differentiate between those? Yeah, so uh, it's a good question. Uh, my colleague here at Argonne, Jack Gilbert, can tell you all about why uh, the microbiome is, uh, is important to our health. That's absolutely true, but I don't think that we want to get our microbiome from the water that we're drinking in uncontrolled ways. Um, I think there are plenty of other ways that we uh, maintain a healthy microbiome in our bodies. I'd much rather have the uh, pathogens out of my water and have it be safe to drink and not have, not just me, but we're talking about, remember, 4,000 children dying every day from water that's just flooded with crazy amounts of pathogens in them. Question over here, Doug. All right. Sorry. Um, your, quote, your quote about um, 
<clears throat> from Ben Franklin about how you need water. That hit home when um, I was younger. There was a hurricane. We were without water for a week. We were without electricity for three weeks. Water is huge. You don't realize how much you miss it. Um, Bill Gates Foundation is doing some kind of toilet study. Is that how practical is that? And that type of uh, evolution and cleaning the water before it even gets out a cheap economical toilet. Okay, so first, uh, it, toilets, I believe, are the largest domestic use of water. So it's, if you're going to target use, at least residential use, toilets are a good place to start. And again, there's no reason for us to be putting fresh drinking water down those toilets. There are places in the world already where they do what's called purple piping, where they bring a separate pipe into your house that is not potable water, and it's used for things like watering your lawn and, and flushing your toilet, um, but not for drinking or you know, taking a shower, for example. Um, so I think that kind of type of a policy needs to be spread more widely. There are lots of other ways to make uh, uh, toilets more efficient. And, and as I said, being the largest use of water in your home, that's a great place to start. I'm not familiar with the Gates Foundation project, but I'm, I'm sure that they're going after a good target there. I, sometime in the future, I see kind of, since we're living in a fixed environment, uh, there's a, you were talking about the energy usage. Uh, if we develop clean power, such as fusion, we get into an interesting equation where you are using the water to create the energy to filter the water. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the energy water nexus again, right? So uh, I mentioned several ways in which energy and water connected. Uh, desalination becomes way more exciting if the cost of energy goes way down. But we, we have an energy crisis too, right? I've given talks on that in the past. So energy demand is also going up. And we need that to be coming from uh, low carbon sources because of climate disruption. And so we're already building solar and wind and hydropower and so on about as fast as we, we can today. And we need to do it even faster just for where we're using our energy today. If we're going to divert tons more energy into uh, water treatment than we are today, that just makes the problem even bigger. So you're right that if we can have some great new technological discovery to make energy even cheaper and massively scalable from where it is today, that helps solve our water problem. I don't know that nuclear fusion is, uh, is the one we want to rely on. The, the joke, well, I don't know that the quantities are relevant in terms of the use, but the, the joke in the energy community with, uh, with fusion is that it's 30 years away all the time. <laughs> so it's actually, it would be fantastic if we could develop uh, uh, fusion, but um, that we can't wait for that to solve these problems. You mentioned that um, all water is local. Argonne has some role in policy. Can you speak to um, interactions and involvements here in the Great Lakes? Great Lakes Commission, are you, are you actively used and sought out to help inform here? Yep. Are there things that you've recommended develop policies have been asked to provide? Yeah, I mean, good question. Great so Lakes is huge so, for yeah, fresh So I want to be careful here. So at Argonne, we don't, you know, we don't make policy or recommend specific policies. We provide the scientific and technological information to help policymakers uh, make their policy. So it's an important distinction to make. But absolutely, uh, not myself, but some of my colleagues here at Oregon, Seth Snyder, the other Seth, as we call him. Well, I'm the other Seth, he's Seth. Um, he, he works heavily with like the Water Reclamation District and others here in the region to uh, look at these, you know, industrial and municipal aspects of water on, on the policy scale, absolutely. Does that answer your question? Oh, uh, Yeah. Oh, by the way, this brings up, there's something I didn't mention earlier. Thank you. There, there's another point I want to make that I think I forgot to say earlier, which is, um, so I, I mentioned underpricing of water and that that leads to a lot of these problems. And so you want to put a, a price on water that is appropriate, but also we want to think of water as a human right. And so if you're going to put a price on it, which has happened, you know, it's been privatized in some countries in the world and that's led to some pretty serious problems. Uh, you have to balance those things, but there's another thing that you don't hear about. So you're using Adam Smith's hand, you know, trying to use market forces to, uh, the invisible hand market forces to, to, to make things happen the way they're supposed to. But there's got to be a, a green hand on the other side that looks out for the environment around us. We are not the only ones who use water. We need water to sustain the ecosystem that is around us. And policies have to be put in place to protect that, because otherwise we all get hurt. And so that's not a specific policy recommendation, but it is a factor that absolutely needs to go into that discussion. So the question over here, oh, Sorry. Um, thank you for your outstanding speech. Um, 
I was wondering, what is your recommended solution for the situation in Flint, Michigan? I, w I wish I had a good solution for that. So for those who haven't listened to the news in the last uh, few months, so what happened there is uh, Flint, the city of Flint, in an effort to save money, switched their water. They were buying water from Detroit, and then they started taking it from the Flint River. And the Flint River is not what has the lead in it, but it's more corrosive, which was then going through the pipes that are made out of lead in people's homes, and then they were getting, they were ingesting lead, which is, which is not good. Um, you know, so there, you don't have a, a whole lot of technological options there other than ripping out the lead pipes and replacing them, or going back to a different water source that is less corrosive. I mean, for example, cleaning up the Flint River. Those are all massive challenges. Uh, I wish I had a great solution for this problem, but I, I don't. You showed the slide of uh, water purity where the semiconductor use was the extreme, and you said you, that's not good drinking water because it would leach minerals or whatever out of your body. Where on that scale is good drinking water, and what, is, what constitutes good drinking water? Um, so what comes out of your tap is, is perfectly good to drink. It's, it, we're, people spend all this money buying you know, bottled water thinking they're getting something that is safer for them. It's no safer than the tap water. In fact, most major brands of, of bottled water are tap water uh, that, that they then maybe do a little more processing to stick a label on and charge you a bunch of money for that you can just get out of your tap. Um, so uh, you know, there's all kinds of different things that are in water and there are you know, guidelines for what is safe for all those different things in the water and your tap water meets those meets those guidelines, not if you're in Flint, Michigan, but, but here it does. So, so, well, so the semiconductor stuff is, is uh, I forget how many nines, but it's like 99.999999% pure. They have their own, those manufacturers have their own on-site water treatment plants that are absolutely state-of-the-art to get every last little bit of impurity out of that water. Because just one little, you know, a few atoms of junk in there can ruin that chip that's in your iPhone. So again, it depends what the material you're talking about. So there are different amounts of materials. You know, there are things that are, that you, you want some minerals in water. Uh, it actually tastes weird. If you drink, I don't recommend it, but if you drink distilled water, which is purer than, than tap water, it feels weird in your mouth and tastes weird, and it's because it doesn't have those minerals in it. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head of what all the, you know, typical concentrations are, and of course it depends on which muni municipality you live in, what's in there. The fact is, though, that in almost everywhere in this country, at least, your tap water meets all of those uh, guidelines and is perfectly safe to be drinking. Question down front here, Seth. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you know of, I don't know, one, two, three different companies that are really doing cool things with water and really like kind of leading edge in terms of that. Um, I'm wary of uh, uh, promoting any particular businesses. <laughs> So what I would say, though, is that I think there are massive opportunities in this space, uh, from my viewpoint, to solve global problems, but from a business person's standpoint, to make a lot of money. Um, there are enormous needs in this water space, and they're growing dramatically going, going forward. And so those companies that take advantage of these opportunities will probably do well. I would say that that is up in the air. So. The water research world is actually not that big. So if you look at sort of my other hat I wear as a solar energy researcher, every major research university everywhere in the world has at least one solar energy researcher. Some of them might have 12 of them. Um, but you look around, where are the water researchers? They're pretty rare. They're kind of hard to find. There aren't that many of them. I mean, they exist. Israel's got, for a long time now, a strong program in water. Singapore does work in the space there. Australia, there are other places where there are, there are you know, pockets of water research. But um, there's just a massive vacuum right now, and this is exactly what Argonne wants to fill. We've got the material science and analysis and environmental impact that, uh, interpretation, all of these things, these pieces of expertise here, which we can put together and turn on this problem of water. Are there any significant efforts going on right now to reduce the number of childhood deaths? So sure. I mean, there are plenty of you know, NGOs and, and certainly the, the governments where those things are happening. I mean, that doesn't happen so much here in the United States. We're talking about mostly in the developing world. And I mean, this is not a, an unknown problem. These are, the UN has been shouting about this for a very long time. And there are you know, foundations and others who go out there and try and, you know, try and fix it. But uh, obviously, there's a very long way to go.
Yeah, that's right. I mean, the investment to really solve that problem is many, many, many billions of dollars. Right? Um, I was wondering, uh, sure. you, you said that in your slides, so in 55 years, is that what it said? That uh, the, the growth in demand? Right. By the or year 2050, it'll go up 55 percent. Yeah. So how optimistic are you that we're going to be able to put in place a lot of the, some of these things? It's it's scary to me. <laughs> it is scary, um, but there are solutions, technological and policy, that can that can get us there. But it is, as I said, going to change the way we live. There are very unsustainable ways in which we function today. There are, you know, the agricultural centers in this country are not necessarily the places where the water is, and that's not really sustainable. They've been living off groundwater, which, as I mentioned, is not uh, inexhaustible. Thank you for your. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you're in, it said on the first slide you're a nanoscientist, so this is a great question. I'm a really small scientist. <laughs> <laughs> but you're so big in person, right? Um, how much risk is there to our water supply for nanoparticles oh, good now question. being yeah. dumped in Lake Michigan from cosmetics and everything? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so this is something that we take very seriously here, and, and most uh, you know, nanoscience centers do take very seriously, is what makes nanomaterials so interesting and cool and exciting is that they have different properties than their bulk counterparts. You can take gold, which is completely inert, noble metal, and when you make it into a nanoparticle size, it suddenly has catalytic activity. These are the kinds of things that happen with, with nanomaterials, which make them so interesting, but of course that means then, you know, regulations that have been developed to, uh, without having this in mind, and they're focused on specific materials, don't necessarily uh, uh, point to what the, the concerns are. So. The way that that's dealt with in the research world is we treat nanomaterials as if they are extremely hazardous unless we know otherwise, unless the studies have been done to demonstrate that they are safe. So in the laboratory here, we take all kinds of precautions with personal protective equipment, the way we deal with the waste, everything to make sure that that stuff doesn't get out there in the environment. Now you point out, you know, cosmetics. There are nanomaterials out there in the world around us. Sunscreens have nanoparticles in them. You know, there are uh, uh, plenty of other examples of this. And some of those things do get into the environment and there are you know, ongoing conversations about are those a concern or not? And some of them are, and some of them aren't, and that's something that absolutely needs to be taken seriously. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for um, your wonderful lecture. I am an AP environmental science teacher, so I was just wondering if you have any words of wisdom for future hopeful um, environmental scientists. Yeah, well, I'd say this is, I mean, this is an exciting time if you want to um, have an impact on the world around you. You know, climate, energy, water, these are all, you know, major challenges. They're the biggest challenges not only we face today, but probably humankind has ever faced. And so if you can make an impact on that in your, in your job, that, what more exciting uh, opportunity there is there than that? Hi. Um, so I know you said that water is usually a local problem, um, but as we've seen with global warming and things like that, which I understand is more of a diffused um, global problem, that there had to be some international agreement and collaboration in order to, I think, mitigate or, or um, to kind of control some of that environmental damage. So even though water is mainly a local problem, do you think that there needs to be a equivalent international agreement or coalition um, in order for us to start kind of making headway in the area of water conservation? That's a good question and uh, it's a complex question. Um, so I, I can't, there's no way I can address all the various dimensions of, of what that would be. Um, but I do want to mention that I think one space where, where policy really can make an impact is in virtual water. As I mentioned, this is not something that policymakers, I think, have really even looked at in detail, but it's an important thing because we are moving water on a massive scale all around the world, but just unseen to all of us. And I think um, we could probably do that in much more intelligent ways, um, thinking of it as water more holistically, and that's just not something that's happened yet. More question, please. One thing you said when you mentioned about virtual water, it kind of bothered me. Um, 
you, you talked about growing alfalfa in this country and exporting it to S Saudi Arabia where they're using it to feed cows. But when we export the alfalfa, it's dried. So we use the water here to grow the alfalfa and then we dry the alfalfa and right. ship over dried alfalfa. So, so the water is coming back into the system here. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the water uh, that puts on those fields to grow the hay is coming from groundwater. So we're taking water from under the ground that won't end up back in that same aquifer for God knows how long, depending on what aquifer you're pulling it from. We dump it on the ground, it ultimately gets evaporated into the atmosphere, and then it goes somewhere else, right? So you're depleting that local groundwater resource. Yeah, the, the total water in the system, it never goes away. And like I said, the same water that's here has been here since the dawn of time, right? So we're not taking water out of the planet, we're just moving it. So you're, t you're extracting groundwater and that evaporation does not then go right back into that aquifer. It, go, it gets spread all around. I mean, a small amount of it might end up back in that aquifer, but nowhere near as much as what you took out. Does that make sense? There was another question here, Seth, in the front, if yep. you don't mind. Sure. No more. Wait, let her, Mike. on a more macro level, you know, it was very eye-opening. I'm just wondering on a more, quote, micro, not, man, not nano, micro level, uh, at a household level, I had heard actually that dryer sheets are pollutants for the water, which I would never have thought. So are there things that you could shed some light on at a household level that, you know, we're... Sure. There, are, there are countless practices that we could do better locally. As I said, we're all responsible for our local water, right? So we should take care of our local water. So uh, pharmaceuticals, for example, I mentioned all these micropollutants, which are now in our water stream. Most of that becomes because we, we uh, flush things down the toilet. When we, d you know, the pills you don't use or whatever, you just dump them down the toilet, you should recycle those. There are places now that you can do that, one example. And of course, just being more efficient, using water efficient fixtures in your house for your shower and your, and your faucets, um, using appropriate landscaping around your house. Turf grass is a terrible idea. Um, you can j use native plants that don't need to be watered much, if at all. Um, there are plenty of examples like this, smart irrigation systems for your lawn if you are going to irrigate it. Uh, you know, countless ways in which we can be more efficient in our own homes with the water that we use. Well, thank you very much, Seth. Again, thank you.